The first time I heard about the Feynman technique was a few years ago when I was watching Scott Young's video on this technique. Over the years, increasing interest in this technique has been spreading throughout the internet community and its use has been popularized by people like Thomas Frank. His video, How to Learn Faster with the Feynman Technique, was visualized by over 5 million people. Thomas produced lately one more video to explain a kind of Feynman Technique revisited. This technique's main purpose is to help students, or more in general, learners, attain faster learning. Although its popularity, I found out a few aspects that weaken heavily the great value people tend to ascribe to it. For this reason, the question I want to answer is, why is the Feynman Technique inaccurate and what to do instead? I will structure the video as follows. I will first show that Feynman did not devise this technique and then I will follow up with the illustration of the technique steps. I explain what's wrong with that particular step and finally, I propose simple approach to eliminate the problems associated with this technique's implementation. I would like to first point out a kind of gleaning uh, which can be enclosed in the following question. Why is this technique named after Richard Feynman? I bet anyone would be tempted into thinking that this technique was devised by Feynman himself. However, things are a bit different. If we dig a little bit more into the mess that we find on the internet, we find out that Feynman has never devised a step-by-step -step procedure for learning complex subjects. So where does it come from? Wikipedia does not explain who's the inventor of the technique. If a medium does not talk about it, but it implicitly makes a weird association of the technique with Feynman's studying methods described in a notorious biography by James Click. Then I have given a look at Thomas Frank's website, College Infogeek, where he talks about the Feynman and the improved Feynman technique. I'll talk about it in a while. In her book, A Mind for Numbers, Barbara Oakley claims the Feynman technique is a Scott Young's idea. What about Carl Newport? Carl is a professor of computer science and author of influential books like Digital Minimalism. I recommend this book, it's really beautiful. He does not explicitly talk about the Feynman technique, rather the Feynman notebook method. In Scott Young's website, he does not explicitly ascribe the technique invention to him, but he provides a detailed procedure I will show later on. Finally, the other resources provide either an explanation or they claim unshamedly the Feynman technique was devised by Feynman himself. So, at the end of the day, chances are the technique's name was given by Scott Young. Carl Newport instead resisted the temptation of talking about a procedure that Feynman never described himself and preferred to use an eye-catching title based upon James Click's account. Despite Medium tapped into Click's biography too, he went astray by attributing the technique's procedure to Feynman based on it. To the last category belongs all those who do not bother ascribing to Feynman the invention, after all, the technique bears his name. Anyway, this was just a personal curiosity. I rather consider it a gleaning that is quite interesting to highlight. Let's jump into the technique. Step number one, choose your concept. What is torque? How does Bernoulli equation work? What is a harmonic oscillator? Choose the idea you want to understand. Step number two, pretend you are teaching the idea to a new student in order to pinpoint the details you don't understand. Thomas Frank expresses this step as pretend that you are explaining the concept to a child. Unfortunately, this way of thinking might lead easily to the undesired phenomenon of oversimplification. In science, there is an important principle that more or less says, make it simple, but not too much simple. What I disagree with this step is the attitude to simplify, which unavoidably might turn into what is known as oversimplification's fallacy. People appear to be increasingly seeking simple answers to complex problems and it has been recently found out that people love the convenience of the website although they know the trap of misinformation. Moreover, and most importantly, it is Feynman who indirectly discourages people from having this kind of attitude. In the following video, the interviewer asks Feynman repeatedly why two magnets repel each other and after trying to explain the thing as simple as he could, as if he was trying to explain it as a child, he argues this. But I really can't do a good job, any job, of explaining magnetic force in terms of something else that you're more familiar with because I don't understand it in terms of anything else that you're more familiar with. In other words, Feynman rightly says, hey, 
I can't oversimplify, I cannot provide a simpler version than this based on what you're familiar with because the world is complex, physics is complex, everything is complex. And this is what many of us want. We want simple answers to difficult problems. Now, what does that mean? It simply means that it is possible to answer why questions certainly, but you must know what I'm talking about. And this presupposes the knowledge of specific jargon. But if this is the case, I cannot explain things has if I'm teaching it to a child because a child is assumed to lack the required background to understand it. So this is something that contradicts the ideas underlying the technique itself. Step number three, whenever you get stuck, go back to the book. Exactly the things you don't understand. Whenever you get stuck, go back to the reference materials, lectures, or a teacher assistant and reread or relearn the material until you get it enough that you can explain it on the paper. Now, during my career in three universities in Italy, Germany, and the Czech Republic, I did not meet one, I mean, one single student who deals with a subject differently. I did this for ages because I think it is the most obvious way to close the gaps. I propose the following two tactics to explore a concept's idea and test your understanding. First, Ask specific questions about the concept and close the gap between your current knowledge and the actual answers to those questions. How do you carry that through? Simply use the interrogatory words who, what, how, why, where, and when to generate one question at a time. As soon as you answer the question, move to the next one and if you do not know how to answer that question, write it down. The process stops as soon as you get five new questions you don't know how to answer to prioritize these questions for your research. A second tactic that I propose is this. Pick up the concept you want to understand and seek to express the same concept without using the keywords this explanation relies upon. Let's start with an easy example. The New Oxford American Dictionary defines democracy as a system of a government by the whole population or all the eligible members of a state, typically three elected representatives. Now, remove the following keywords and try to explain the same underlying idea without using them. That's a rather difficult exercise, yet it represents a good test. If you indeed captured the concept's essence, you would be able to express it differently which strongly indicates you can move with ease among the various logical levels related to that concept. Let's try to express the definition of a vector valid function. After eliminating a few words like function, component, parameter, we might say that a vector value is a way of associating a set of points in the plane or space to real numbers t. Step number four, simplify and create analogies. Finally, wherever you write down a wordy or confusing explanation for something, try to either simplify the language or create an analogy to understand it better. You'll notice I used both of these in this quick demonstration. I simplified the language of torque to explain it in terms of twisting. Second, I was able to understand it through analogy by taking the torque vector and describing it as a corkscrew motion, tightening with right or loosening with left. Now, this is a critical step. Analogies are very useful tools to study difficult concepts, but they suffer a big problem. It is very easy to compare different situations based on surface features, and it is therefore very easy to overlook key aspects and stifle research for new ideas once we have built one. It is not a case there exists the so-called analogy fallacy. A second problem is connected to confirmation bias and anchoring to non-psychological phenomena. A confirmation bias is our tendency to only seek information that is consistent with our initial judgment and to disregard contradictory data. What does that mean? It means that when you explain a concept through analogical situations, you tend to ignore the dissimilarities. Anchoring instead is our tendency to accept a piece of information as a starting point for generating additional ideas. Let's look at them more closely. Both phenomena are explained by the following two experiments. During an experiment conducted in the 70s, researchers asked a first Israeli group which pair of countries is more similar, West Germany and East Germany, or Sri Lanka and Apple. 
most people answered was Germany and East Germany. When researchers asked to a different set of subjects, which pair of countries is more different? Was Germany and East Germany or Sri Lanka and Nepal? They gave the same answer. According to the scientists, this was due to the fact that by and large, Israeli knew more about the Germanies than about Sri Lanka and Nepal. In other words, they have ignored the similarities. Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky asked to estimate different quantities in percentage, for instance, the percentage of African countries in the membership of the United Nations. Researchers used the Wheel of Fortune to determine a number between 0 and 100 in the subject's presence. After each stop, the subjects were asked whether the actual percentage was greater or less than the number showing on the wheel. In other words, the subject's decisions are anchored to that starting input. Interestingly, researchers found out that not only the subject's estimate was influenced by the input, but also by the stream of data that was provided. When told to perform these two sets of multiplications at the maximum speed, subjects deem this computation larger than the second one. So, how might we use analogies while eliminating the occurrence of these two psychological straps? The idea is to infer new knowledge after having generated not one analogy, but at least three analogies to avoid we land on the first similar situation prematurely and to account more for the differences. How do we infer new knowledge? Here is a straightforward example which is drawn from the study of C++ programming language. After having generated several analogies for the activation records data structure concept, I have associated this concept with that of fast twitch fibers that are activated through heavy loads, and I have elicited new knowledge by leveraging new questions that shed light on aspects that I did not consider yet. For example, if heavy loads activate fast twitch fibers, what does activate the record? If heavy load activate fast twitch fibers and allow growth and higher power, does a function activation record allow any kind of growth? If yes, which one? If the two situations were to unfold the same way, what would it be like the queue that you expect to appear? Your task is to transfer new knowledge. In other words, this is a far better option than merely simplifying through the first analogy that comes into your mind. Here are the steps to use analogies when you study complex subjects in math, engineering, physics, or any science-based academic field, or even when you learn new skills. Step number one, describe the concept. Step number two, brainstorm new analogies, at least three. Step number three, pay attention to the difference too. Step number four, choose the analogy that ranks higher that is the one that has more similarities. Step number five, infer new knowledge, asking new questions. Least but not last, is Thomas Frank's self-critique step he embedded into the Feynman technique useful? At this point, I want to put my phone on a tripod and pick a concept or a set of facts to present and explain to my phone as if I were explaining it to you or to a friend. So in this case, I pick these six different diarthrodial joints in the body and explain how they work in the video. So the way to imagine a saddle type joint and how it moves is if you took your knuckles here and took the other knuckles here and sort of sandwiched them together. Now this is my own analogy, they did not teach this in the course, but it sort of is analogous to how you'll see illustration. Once I'm done recording, I use the YouTube app to upload an unlisted copy of this video to a second YouTube channel I have specifically for my own learning and for this LPC technique. And because it's on YouTube, I can then go ahead and paste it into my Notion, which will embed it. And that brings us to step three, critique. At this point, I'm going to watch through the video and I'm going to look for, again, three things. Number one, factual 
actual errors. So for example, at one point in the video, I mentioned the carpals of the hand and the carpals of the feet. Those are the tarsals. I'm gonna also look for anything where I could be a little bit more clear or more correct in my explanation. So at one point I mentioned the joint between the metacarpal and the uh, phalangeal bones here in the thumb. Well, that is a joint, but it's called the metacarpophalangeal joint. So I should actually use the name of the joint. And finally, number three, if I have any questions that come up in this critique process, and I almost always do, I wanna go out and get answers to those questions. And this is just another way that encourages me to deepen my understanding, often by using supplemental research. You know, this is actually a very good idea indeed. However, I would rather apply this step only ahead of the final oral examination rather than applying it to our study systematically. The reason is that it takes time irrespective of whether or not we are using Notion. But if we apply this to prepare ourselves for an oral exam, that would certainly have a high value.